And I'd like to also acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of these lands. The purpose of this town hall is to hear from you. We know this has been a challenging year. Uh, we want to know how things are going. What's working? What are you struggling with? And what do you have questions about? Uh, we'll begin today by hearing brief updates from campus support and services. Uh, we'll then open the Q&A to take your questions, which will be the majority of the meeting. We'll be taking notes and we'll also follow up with a summary of the discussion and responses to some questions that perhaps we didn't have the answers at our fingertips for today. Uh, to get things started, I'd like to introduce Ananya Mukherjee Reed, our Provost and Vice President Academic for UBC Okanagan. Ananya? Thank you, Paul. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, you know, one of the things we miss um, about COVID or also about being an administrator is we don't get to spend that much time with graduate students, which is really one of the most wonderful things about uh, being a faculty member. Uh, as Paul already said, um, it, you know, as soon as um, the pandemic started, we began our series of town halls because it was very important not only to connect to campus, but also to um, hear all of you and your um, hear from you as to what is working and what is not and where we need to change and increase or uh, do our supports differently. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing that and I will uh, be working with uh, Paul and Peter and um, all other uh, leaders to make sure that, um, you know, our graduate students needs are met to the best of our ability. Uh, we have a lot of hope and faith that we would be able to serve you, you know, as best as we can. It's not going to be perfect, but um, at least the intent is there. And I look forward to hearing about where we could uh, support you better. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya. Uh, I'd like to introduce Phil Barker, our Vice Principal of Research. Phil? Thanks, Paul, and welcome, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you today and um, give you a bit of an update on how things are looking from the research side of the campus and to hear from you on uh, things that are um, barriers or, or, or even some good news that you might have. Just to start with uh, a little bit of uh, background on the campus that you've joined. Um, you know, UBC Okanagan is really on a very strong growth trajectory in large part because uh, graduate students like you have chosen to come here and be part of uh, what is turning out to be a really exciting success story in Canada. The research activity on the campus is up uh, well over 300% just in the last 10 years and uh, more than a doubling of the graduate student population has taken part uh, in that time. And um, you know, needless to say, that's uh, created some uh, pressures, but hopefully also some opportunities. And so uh, I can say from the VP research point of view, there's no question that graduate students are an absolutely critical element of what we're trying to achieve from uh, a research point of view. In many ways, graduate students are really where the rubber hits the road in uh, translating uh, what we're doing from a research point of view into concrete results and outcomes. And so very grateful that you've chosen to come to UBC Okanagan and apply your considerable expertise to uh, what we're doing here. Just a couple words on um, where we are with uh, the pandemic and how we're um, uh, moving our way through uh, the various moving parts. Uh, most of you, uh, especially that have been here for the last few months are aware that we experienced a research curtailment uh, on very short notice last March. That went on for many weeks as we were trying to understand the implications of the pandemic and the risks that we were potentially placing people in. Uh, we then eased into uh, first phase of new research activity. Um, and then a second phase that started uh, in the summer 
that allowed for people to work within sites on campus that um, would support uh, social distancing and uh, allow work to be carried out in a safe way with a variety of building constraints and the like in place. Um, we're still in that phase and anticipate we will be in that phase uh, for uh, at least several months. The one uh, specific area in which we still have a really significant uh, decrease in activity is in face-to-face -face, uh, participant research uh, on which we still have a hold uh, based on the risks that exist in the community. Uh, otherwise, uh, hopefully I'm looking forward to hearing from people that may have specific challenges. Um, people uh, that are on this call are, are in situations where they are getting access and able to move forward with their research programs. So Paul, thank you. I'll stop there and uh, wait to see if there's uh, questions or comments uh, later in the program. Thank you, Phil. Uh, due to some scheduling conflicts, we're going to temporarily open up the Q&A session for Phil because he has to uh, head off before we reach the open questioning period. Uh, so if you have any questions that would be directly relevant to uh, Phil, please put them in the Q&A now and we will throw them his way. Paul, I'm able to stick around for a few minutes. So if questions in addition come in, uh, I'm, I'm happy to you know, take them on a little bit later if that's helpful. Okay, we'll handle a couple of them now as they come in and then if oh, you're still here for the next bit, we'll do that too. Uh, from Carrie Rempel, is it possible to get more access to on-campus meeting space to meet our supervisors and peers? Yeah, thanks for the question, Carrie. Um, the situation right now is there's still a hold on person-to-person, face-to-face meetings on campus. Um, hopefully we'll be able to move into a new phase where that you know, isn't the standard. Uh, but for now, unfortunately, the answer uh, has to remain no until we get further guidance from uh, public health officials. Uh, I should, I, one, maybe one thing I can add to that is there's an active uh, uh, steering group uh, out of which I sit along with other UBC colleagues and many other uh, post-secondary institutions that are now actively talking about uh, what the next phase of guidelines will look like. And hopefully we'll be entering into a new more open phase in the not too distant future. Thank you, Phil. Are there any more questions that we can direct Phil's way uh, at this quick interim question session? Oh, what about access to our on-campus offices? Uh, I have an office on campus, but have limited ability to work from it. Many students have challenges at home with shared space. Also from Carrie. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, for that question as well. Um, that's one that you can work on uh, with your supervisor who in turn can work on with the department chair and the Assist associate dean of research uh, within your specific faculty. Um, there are circumstances in which uh, office access, uh, individual office access in particular, uh, can, can, be, uh, can be arranged. Uh, and depending on circumstances, uh, certainly I can say from the campus point of view, we recognize that uh, home circumstances may not be ideal for the situation that people find themselves in. So by all means, have the discussion with your supervisor and um, uh, your supervisor in turn with the ADR. And uh, uh, I wish you luck in sorting that out. Of course, we're here to help if uh, you need some further guidance from my side of the fence. Okay, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'd now like to introduce you to Peter Simpson who's the Dean of the College of Graduate Studies. Peter? Thanks, Paul. Hi, all, and, and thanks for coming. Uh, you know, we're doing the talking at the moment, but the real goal of these town halls is for us to hear from you and, and have the opportunity to listen to you and for you to be heard. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is the way that graduate studies works. You know, our goals are to recruit great students from all over the world and have them successfully complete degrees. And, and, you know, so our success is defined in terms of your success. And, and in that process, you know, for you to get a UBC education. So we appreciate the efforts that you're making, despite the very challenging times. 
and you know it's a it really is a success that in the last um, nine months or so, I guess we're up to almost a year now. Uh, despite COVID, we've had over 400 students successfully graduate, you know, with a UBC education. And so that's all great stuff. On to some practical points, uh, recognizing some of the challenges you're facing. We've revised some of our criteria for awards eligibility to expand the, uh, the time period available for, for award eligibility for those of you who've gone over time due to COVID-induced delays. And you can look on our website to find some information about that to find out if you are eligible for awards as a COVID measure that you would otherwise not have been eligible for. Um, I appreciate that besides all of the practical challenges of campus access and so on, uh, social isolation has certainly been a um, source of source of difficulty and, and it's, it's hard to keep morale up, let's put it that way. And uh, so I wanted to make you aware that we do have community graduate facilitators organizing some social events. And Nicole Vanderleest and Manish Kumar, and you can find information about that on our website also. And uh, perhaps somebody will post a link in the chat for you. Um, recognizing all of that, it's important this time to focus on self care. And I think it's very easy, um, you know. Most of us are very driven people, and, and it's easy to get into a state as a student where if you're progressing slowly due to circumstances beyond your own control, like the current COVID circumstances, it's a little too easy to beat yourself up for that and feel like you, the, the solution is for you to work harder or something. And that may not be the solution. You know, what you can do is what you can do. And uh, so I bring this up to point out the importance of self-care and later in this session, uh, there will be some resources pointed out to you. Uh, so just to keep this short, it would be great to hear from you and um, onward. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and now I'd like to ask our final speaking panelist, introduce our final speaking panel. Oh, no, we have two more. My apologies. Uh, first, I'll introduce you to Philip Riker, from the, who's the manager of International Programs and Services. Thank you, Paul. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to speak to you today. As um, similar to what uh, Peter just mentioned, it's definitely been an interesting year, the last uh, you know nine months in particular, in terms of immigration changes and the ongoing cycle of shifts in government policies has kept, I'm sure, many of you who are still overseas uh, busy with understanding the different implications. So today, I'm going to just give you a bit of a brief overview of some of the, the most recent uh, pieces that have uh, come up and um, just give you a little bit of a highlight uh, for that. And the one thing I'm gonna emphasize though throughout this whole uh, discussion is please do definitely check with our office before um, making any uh, decisions. Um, the content is changing frequently. Um, as I said here, they're constant, it's accurate as of today, February 24th. We just had some new information that was uh, new policies that were implemented on Monday, the 22nd. So as you can see, it, it changes very rapidly. Uh, for all our students out there, uh, please do check your emails. A email was sent out February 19th on Friday with all of the most recent information and links. Um, so you're able to actually navigate the different pieces um, that might impact your ability to travel to Canada. So that includes the UBC International Student Guide, the Traveling to Canada Guide, and the COVID-19 FAQs. They've all been updated. And if you ever have questions, you're able to reach out to ips.ubco uh, at ubc.ca. Brief overview for travel restrictions is as of February 22nd, all travelers require an additional COVID-19 test on arrival at the airport or border crossing. And uh, you are also required to quarantine for three days in a government approved hotel in the first city of arrival in Canada. So that if you arrive, for example, in Toronto, you will be required to quarantine for three days. And upon a negative test after those three days, 
conditional on that, you're able to continue on your, your travels and finish off the remaining part of the 14 day quarantine. Um, right now, there were also obviously delays in terms of being able to book those hotels. There's a lot of feedback from that. The government is working on shifting um, the ability to book them into an online setting that should be live. In It, it is either live today or it should be live later today. Um, so there are a lot of pieces that continue to be updated, shift, um, and it's a very fluid situation. So I realize how frustrating that is. Our advisors are doing their best to have the latest up-to-date information. We're tightly uh, connected with both Universities Canada and CBIE. So we get these updates as soon as they're ready to be uh, shared. Uh, there are sometimes delays in terms of the information that comes out from the government as they're still working out pieces as well too. So I just wanna assure you that as soon as that information is available and verified, we update that to you uh, and are able to advise you on the, the best option uh, at that time. Regarding PGWP eligibility, this was an update that was came in conjunction with that new February 22nd deadline. December 31st now is the new uh, end date for uh, the ability to study overseas and still have that time count towards PGWP post-graduation work permit eligibility, which I know is a big important uh, topic for many students, especially grad students. There's a lot of great opportunities after you graduate. And so ensuring that you meet all the requirements is a big part of that. So, the good news here is that it has been extended now until the end of this year. So previously it was April 30th, 2021, and now those courses that time can actually be kept uh, as part of, of your, your program right up until the 31st. Um, so, and for accelerated programs, that's also good because uh, you're able to complete it outside of Canada and still remain eligible. So this is a major policy shift, a positive one um, for from the government of Canada. So it, it kind of counterbalanced with the latest travel restrictions, although it's still, uh, we understand, is a very stressful time to try and navigate this and, and think about all the, the costs and extra time associated with that. But I just want to reassure you that we are doing our uh, best to advocate for the international students uh, more broadly in the sector. We are working, again, with CBIE and Universities Canada to showcase what the practical implications are for, for many students and whether it's processing times or uh, the, uh, the, you know, the long, the uh, short, the, the inability to get the work permits in, in a time period, all of these issues are being brought up. We have frequent meetings about every two weeks with IRCC and they are aware of these issues and we are continuing to bring them up um, at those meetings. So I just wanna reassure you that we are doing everything that we can However, during this time with COVID, there are just a number of challenges that they're all facing at the same time. Um, for IPS office hours, we are fully online. We're available Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. Um, and then we do drop-ins uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Those are a great opportunity to pop in. And you, depending on the time, uh, you know, there's peak times, obviously, when there's uh, policy changes where you might be waiting a little bit longer for a drop-in. The other option is we can always make an appointment uh, with one of our advisors for a one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, but the drop-in appointments are a great option and uh, usually can get seen very quick. Um, if you're not sure where to start, feel free to email us at that email address, ips.ubco at ubc.ca. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, we can also connect you with different staff resources uh, on campus. Uh, many of us have been students ourselves, have been international students. We understand many of the challenges that you would be facing. Um, and so we're here to help and we just uh, want to ensure that you feel as connected as possible during this very odd time uh, in this virtual environment. So thank you very much and I'll be around later to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Phil, and thank you to uh, your entire team for staying on top of this ever shifting landscape over the past year. That's been quite a Herculean effort. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Sophie Vinette, uh, who's a counselor with Health and Wellness. Sophie? Thank you. All right, I'll just share my screen as well. Here we go. So hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Sophie Vanette and I'm part of the counseling team uh, that is falling under the umbrella of health and wellness. So I'll tell you a little bit more um, about our services, uh, give you an update as well as upcoming things uh, that you may be interested in. 
So as it's been mentioned before, your well-being is really important um, and it's, it's a huge part of your academic uh, success. So what I'd like to do today um, is just give you a bit of an update as far as operations. So we are up and running. Uh, most of our services are taking place virtually as well. Um, if you're in need of a counseling appointment, um, most of our counselors um, will offer virtual or phone um, as well as in person if it is requested. So if you are living in the Kelowna area or you're close to campus and you'd rather meet in person, that is feasible. We do have to follow a protocol uh, in light of the pandemic, um, but we can walk you through that as well. So we're usually open 9 a.m. to 4 p.m year round in the summer months uh, we do have reduced staffing but we are still uh, running during those months we also have access to physician as well as nurses so if you have any physical or medical needs that need to be attended to um, feel free to give us a call uh, 250-807-9270 is the best way to reach us you can also email us um, as well and our website is listed so i've um, compile the list of different resources. Um, I won't have a chance just for the sake of time today to go through each and every one of them. But what I did want to mention is that there's um, all kinds of uh, services and initiatives that are accessible depending on your situation. So the first three links uh, that are listed uh, are part of health and wellness. Um, and I invite you to, to have a look at them. I can uh, give a copy possibly to Haley if that's okay. And students that are interested in, in getting all those links on one page, we can definitely forward that to you. There's a lot of different groups and workshops taking place as well online uh, that you can have access. Some are more geared towards mental health. Some are more uh, social um, events. So those are always good ways to connect and also feel a little bit less isolated. That's one of the themes that has been recurring during this pandemic is that a lot of people are feeling isolated or not um, as much connected to their peers. Um, student life also have different activities and recreations associations and clubs and again we had to adjust accordingly just because of restrictions but it's always a nice way to um, to try and connect the COGS website has a great section on health wellness and safety if you're not already familiar with that um, there's a tons of resources listed there as well for students who are uh, abroad um, or not in the province of BC right now. Um, this service is called the Student Assistance Program, so SAP, the acronym. This is good for any UBC student, regardless of where you're living. What we've run into a little bit is that um, because of jurisdiction issues and legalities, health professionals that are residing in BC can only provide services as far as counseling goes, for example, to residents of BC. So if you're an international student who is residing in BC, no problem at all. But if you're in your home country and you're trying to get some supports, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. So uh, the Student Assistance Program is a great way to get connected. Um, it's 24-7, uh, confidential, free of charge. And there are several different ways you can uh, request services. So it could be online virtually could be by phone there's instant messaging and uh, chat as well as requesting in person whenever that's feasible um, i want to mention just for clarification this is open to any ubc students so regardless um, if you're international or domestic or where you're living um, if you need some assistance connecting with the appropriate resources and you're not residing in bc please don't hesitate uh, reaching out to health and wellness. We'll never turn anybody away. Uh, we're here to help. It's just that an, as an ongoing basis, we would not be able to provide um, uh, ongoing therapy. There's also the student care plan, which you're automatically enrolled in unless you've opted out. And I'm mentioning this because when we think about uh, wellness um, and a holistic approach, there's all kinds of uh, coverage under that uh, plan that you have access to. So I encourage you to get uh, more familiar with it if you haven't already. There are things like um, dental vision care, chiropractic, massage therapy, 
physiotherapy as well as funding for private therapy if you if you wish to pursue that so that's about six hundred dollars per school year that can go towards uh, private therapy i've also mentioned the early alert uh, there was a question submitted um, prior to the meeting around what do i do if i'm a supervisor or perhaps a TA who's concerned about a fellow student. So we have a system in place called Early Alert and it is a confidential, um, secure online form that any staff, faculty or TA can fill out um, very quickly. There's all kinds of little ticky boxes and basically it's just to help identify the type of concern you have about the student. And once it is sent to our early alert advisor electronically, we do the reach out. So if it's more academically related, an academic advisor will reach out to the student. If it's more mental health related, a counselor will do that reach out. And often that first step is the hardest step. So if we can help with that, um, that's, that's, that's part of what we do. All right. Um, I've also had the opportunity this term to work more closely with graduate students around understanding the current realities that they're facing. What we are realizing more and more is that your reality can be quite different than let's say an undergraduate degree, an undergraduate student. So um, although there can be some overlap, I think uh, there's been some situations or maybe different types of challenges that uh, you've encountered that um, may need additional support or help around. So we wanna try and get a good grasp of what are your needs around your own well-being or just mental health in general? What are some of the perceptions or experiences that you've had around um, the supports that are currently available? Or maybe what is missing? What are some of the gaps or barriers as far as um, access or maybe the way it's communicated? So there will be an opportunity to provide some feedback. Um, and I would love to hear from you. Um, so if anyone is either interested in participating in a focus group, there will be a few focus groups uh, being set up in March, uh, specifically for graduate students. And it would be about an hour of your time. So if, if any of you are interested, please email me directly. If you are interested in providing some feedback, but maybe you don't feel comfortable doing it in a focus group type of setting, I still welcome that feedback. And of course, everything is, is confidential. Um, this will help really uh, inform future decisions around how services are planned uh, for well being and what are the top priorities and concerns that graduate students have. So that is my bit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, it is now time for us to handle any questions that you may have. Uh, we have a handful of other people with different expertises if needed as well. Uh, so please feel free to use the Q&A section. Uh, that sends the question to me that I can shout out to whoever needs to hear it. Uh, the chat section works as well if you would prefer to do it that way. I guess while we wait for that to come in, uh, we did get a question earlier that got answered by text, but I'd like to reinforce it because it's a common fear among students who are coming near the end of their program. Uh, Yusif asked uh, regarding the PhD defense for students graduating this semester, uh, so far it is to be done online as we've been doing throughout the COVID crisis. Is there a possibility that that would change last minute? Um, Peter, do you wanna just answer that directly? I realize you typed the text in, but I'm not sure all can see it. Uh, sure. Yes, I, we would not change that at the last minute. If somebody and if somebody is studying in another country, uh, we certainly wouldn't make them come here to defend their thesis. Uh, particularly considering, you know, we've been doing online defenses since last spring, and it's been uh, very successful. There's been a couple of minor problems, but uh, but but a lot less than, than you might have expected. It's been great. Thank you, Peter. 
we got asked uh, if summer term is going to be online. Does anybody here have the definitive answer on that? I'm not sure there is a definitive answer to that, but it's probably safest to assume that it will be mostly online. It's hard, it's hard to have a definitive answer because the, the needs of different programs are, are so different. A lot of decisions are being made at the department or faculty level rather than campus level decisions. Paul, it's okay. I could also speak to this just briefly to say um, there is a survey out currently uh, that closes this evening at 11.59 p.m. and it's a fall restart a survey as we're trying to collect student feedback um, specifically about the plans um, for this fall and understanding what student preferences are um, and if the opportunity to return in some form either in a hybrid or uh, fully return um, is available then uh, we want to have the opinions of students about how to make that uh, a successful transition for them. And so I'll share the, the link uh, for that in the, in the comments section. And uh, I should also introduce myself. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dale Mullings. Uh, I am the AVP students here uh, at the Okanagan. Uh, and I use the pronouns he and him. Thanks. Uh, Dale, there was a follow-up question to that that maybe we can just roll straight into. Uh, can you give a lay of the land as we look forward to the next academic year and what factors are you considering for September 2021? So I could speak to this and then uh, maybe Peter, you could compliment it. But uh, at this time, the direction from Interior Health is still that we're remaining in an online forum. Um, we have been planning for what might be um, a hybrid return uh, for this fall. So some of the resumption planning uh, committee uh, work right now is understanding if a student is moving between um, say coursework that is in person and then moving to a synchronous uh, online course, what's needed to be able to support a student in terms of space, um, quiet and semi-quiet, what uh, spaces can be modified across the campus and be made safe for students to be able to do so. Um, and how do we uh, also prepare for graduate students to be able to return to um, research? Uh, so that's a part of this resumption planning discussion. And so at this time, as I understand it, and this will pass to Peter, some of the discussion is what courses may be able to return in person um, and planning for that um, to build out what could be a, a course schedule. So we've deferred uh, the, the release of registration just a little bit later uh, to be able to help uh, buy a bit of more time as we wait for direction around this from um, from interior health but peter is there anything you want to add to that uh discussions are underway among the deans about the academic side of the picture but it's it's certainly challenging to make a, a firm plan given our lack of, of ability to predict the the future of the public health situation <laughs> Uh, another follow-up question to that, for students who would prefer to remain online until they could get vaccinated, would that be an option? That's a, that's a very good question, and it's one of the things that's part of this discussion among the deans, so it's, it's premature to answer it, but we're certainly aware of the question. Okay. A uh, new line of questioning. Uh, there was a mention of increasing inclusiveness. Not sure if I said that word right. Of awards and bursaries, is there also the possibility of an increase in the number of awards available, or if students need emergency funding, how can they obtain this? I'd like to answer half of that. Uh, we COGS have committed additional funds to programs for the coming academic year out of recognition that there will be students who have been delayed due to COVID and will need some additional funding. Um, the challenge is that our part of the funding package is only one and a small part of the funding package so you know we don't deal with teaching assistantships uh, nor research assistantships but certainly our the funding we make available to programs has been increased 
Um, the question about emergency funding, um, does anybody else have an answer to that? I know Dale and I have certainly had a discussion about what sources are available and, and concluded that's something we need to work on a little bit to figure out, uh, you know, a, having a system that works well. Um, maybe a, a different plug here would be uh, for two things. One, uh, there is a small emergency fund available through enrollment services that's uh, available through them. Um, it is you know, rather small, I think it's up to $500. And for Indigenous students, um, that is up to $750. Um, but also, um, the, there is a survey out currently around uh, the tuition um, consultation, which closes this Friday. In the event, uh, so that information, a question we commonly get is, is that survey even useful? Do we take that into consideration? The question about uh, a tuition increase happening does move forward to board for board to make a decision about a tuition increase, but how the funds are allocated locally, the information from students is critical. Um, and so I would strongly encourage students um, to highlight in that survey how they see the use of those funds and particularly highlighting the need for graduate students around emergency funds would be uh, certainly helpful to place in that uh, in that feedback. We've, Peter and I have talked about that uh, feedback as well, but certainly having um, uh, some other uh, sources of information for that would be helpful. So just encouraging folks to finish that uh, survey by this Friday. Thank you, Dale and Peter. Uh, from Yasmin, being an international student out of province has been an inconvenience to get primary healthcare service. Uh, when I arrived in Canada, I fell down. Uh, this yielded a misalignment in my pelvis. I received primary care and extended services while in BC. When I moved out of BC because of a fellowship, I couldn't get primary services. Uh, I've tried to handle the pain and discomfort. Unfortunately, this is getting so hard and starting to affect my mental health. Given the travel restrictions and current situation of COVID, is there any immediate solution or support to access to healthcare while out of province? Sure, I can uh, jump in on this one. I, I, given that it's a healthcare nature question, I think it'd be best that we take this offline and actually speak with an advisor because there's a lot of follow-up questions related to this. Generally, just for people that they're aware, uh, in BC, you have to wait three months uh, to be covered by MSP. Um, and so during the three months, you do have an automatic healthcare that is covered uh, during that time. Um, when you, if you're at a province, I'm not sure if it's out of country, but there are interprovincial agreements. So there are those pieces to take into consideration as well. And if you have coverage of BC MSP and are temporarily out of the province, you should usually be covered by that. So there are potential options available. I would really encourage you to reach out to one of our advisors. Um, they'd be able to best advise you. And then we can also potentially connect with health and wellness on this one, um, just to have a better understanding of your specific situation. So I'd really encourage you to just email us at ips.ubco.ubc.ca and that'd probably be the best starting point uh, for that question. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Uh, more general graduate, international graduate student question. Are there any resources that help international students adapt to life in Kelowna? For sure. So thank you for that question. That's actually a perfect segue into something I, I forgot to mention at the end of the, the uh, immigration piece. Um, we actually have, we will have a new role starting that is a grad student specialist. We're excited for that. Um, so that'll be sometime later in the spring. Um, so that person is going to be kind of that go-to person in our department. They'll still be, you know, working closely with all campus partners as all of our advisors do, but they'll be able to start running programming, connecting uh, students and staff, uh, students and their families to, uh, you know, groups in the community. We'll be running events. We already sponsor and run a number of events for grad students as well. So there's plenty of opportunities once you are actually on campus. And, you know, here there's, there's lots of different uh, groups that host events throughout the year. Um, there's lots of great ways to get networked and connect uh, on campus and IPS, we are, play a, a big part in that. 
Uh, we love that. That's one of the most fun things of our jobs and the things that has changed the most during COVID-19 is we don't get to celebrate those fun events and activities with you. So we are looking forward to that again. And the overall focus of all of these activities is to help students get a better understanding of Kelowna, what the options are out there for them and connect them to the resources available. Thank you, Phil. Uh, from Robin, it's important to be clear that the amount that will be available to allocate to student priorities is only for one year, as I understand it. Uh, do I correctly understand? Uh, I'm assuming they are talking about the extra tuition revenue. That's what I think this, this is a reference to. So yes, that is correct. So um, the feedback that we're seeking from students is should board pass a tuition increase, the tuition surplus, that allocation that would come back to the Okanagan campus, that would be a one-time only um, allocation to be able to, to support students. And so there are three, four different buckets that are proposed um, that are put out for students. So one example would be to help offset the, the costs of uh, tuition, books, transportation, uh, housing, daycare uh, as examples. Um, and so what we're seeking right now is feedback on what are the priorities for students and then um, how we could uh, allocate those funds um, in a variety of ways through um, either um, one-time only bursary opportunities, emergency funds, uh, investments in opportunities such as a food hub uh, are great examples. So yes, one-time only. Thank you, Dale. Uh, can you speak to the importance of communication of expectations between graduate students and supervisors, especially during COVID? Uh, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, you know, I've, I've been uh, here at UBC Okanagan just since last summer, but I worked in grad studies at Western University for seven years. And um, I, I'd have to say that many, many of the examples I've seen of conflicts between a supervisor and a student uh, stem from, from conflict in expectations that could perhaps have been avoided if there had been um, a, a clear discussion of expectations up front. And I think that, you know, this is a feature of how the academic world works that, that us senior professors have been swimming in this water all our lives and so have a lot of assumptions that everybody understands how all of that works. And in fact, it's not very transparent to students. And just to give you one example to illustrate that, you know, we usually say that a PhD program involves a student performing independent research but we don't really say what we mean by independent and that degree of independence varies greatly with the discipline and with the individual supervisor and the research project and so forth. And, and yet we don't often transparently discuss that. So yes, I think it's, it's very important uh, probably before the student enters the program to have a serious discussion about what the expectations will be. And I think the COVID situation just, just makes all of that more challenging because just because communication is all the more difficult. I, I hope that addresses the question. Um, and I see in the chat, but it's addressed to panelists, um, we do have a student supervisor expectations checklist. Uh, so there's a kind of a guideline for a conversation there. It's not meant to be prescriptive, but just to be a helpful support for what sorts of questions one should be discussing in that conversation. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, are there any foreseeable solutions to TA ships for international students that cannot come back if next year remains online? If that's, if that's for me to answer, the answer is that that's very much something that's managed at the department level because the TA needs vary widely by program and subject area. And it's not clear at this point how much um, 
how much classes in September will be online or will be in person. And so it's not clear how much of the teaching, how much of the teaching assistantship work can be performed remotely or must be performed in person. So that might be a, dis a discussion to have with your program. Uh, Peter, I think a sideline of that question is the ability to pay students who do not currently reside in Canada and do not have a bank account in Canada. Oh yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> I have PTSD from our conversations with human resources about that. Uh, we're, we're very restricted by labor law in our ability to employ uh, students who are not in Canada. And so uh, remote TAing from outside Canada may simply not be possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, has COGS had any conversations about providing specific feedback to students whose tri-agency grant applications were not successful in being forwarded on? Uh, something more specific than just being encouraged to register for the workshop uh, that is co-sponsored by COGS and the Center for Scholarly Communication staff. We're uh, planning next summer to revisit some of our processes around scholarships um, with, with the intent to introduce more structure to help students build better applications. Um, you know, the, the merit of the student is one thing, but the the final selection committee in Ottawa never meets the student. All they see is the, the work of art that the student creates on paper. And so we need to do more work to, to guide that process. So, so yeah, great, great question and we're working on it. Thank you, Peter. Uh, in what ways is COGS helping grad students across disciplines connect, be engaged on, and bring forward initiatives as grad students on anti-racist and anti-colonial actions across campus and across our experiences in OOC, uh, even as we are an online campus now? Uh, are there plans around engaging students? I hate to keep giving the same answer, but you know that's another area where discussions are underway, but um, have not have not arrived at any concrete conclusions yet. Dale, do you have any uh, knowledge of what's going on on that front? Yeah, let me maybe share two things. Um, one that's happened immediately, and I think you know Phil could speak to it briefly, and that is. Um, uh, in February, at the beginning of February, we have merged two operations, um, our uh, IPS, our International Program of Services, and our Go Global teams. Uh, Go Global really supports the work of uh, having students uh, have international experiences uh, embedded in their, in their program or um, through exchange opportunities and supporting uh, safety abroad for graduate students who might be on research. And what we see as the opportunity uh, is a re-envisioning of how IPS and Go Global work together now as one unit with intercultural um, understanding and fluency being a, a core center of the work um, and building relationships and, and focusing on uh, anti-oppression uh, work uh, across the campus. Um, to a, a second piece to this is um, in this as early as this summer, um, a new fund under the Excellence Fund is going to be established, which will be open for application from student groups, from staff, and from faculty. Um, and it's an intercultural excellence fund where uh, groups can request up to $5,000 for seed funds to create initiatives across the campus uh, to focus on uh, anti-racism, uh, anti-oppression, uh, opportunities to, to bring cultures together as examples, uh, but also uh, this is a multi-year fund. So there's also going to be an opportunity for students, staff and faculty to apply for uh, funds for up to three years to uh, initiate initiatives to, to help shape uh, the campus experience uh, more from a grassroots type approach. So maybe just two kind of pieces to the puzzle there that are that are ramping up now. Yeah, and I'll just jump on that too and just uh, emphasize the work that uh, one of our colleagues, Sahar Ahmed, already does, which is the Intercultural Development Program uh, that's been developed for the last three years. 
uh, very successful. The, we've had a number of grad students over the years who have been part of that. Um, so there's different uh, cohorts that can, can go through the program. She's worked with the TA, student staff, um, engineering department has also had a specific one designed for them. That's shifted obviously online uh, in this, in this uh, environment. So it's all now in Canvas, but there are also still sessions that are run. So it's had to be re-envisioned a little bit this year, but there are definite opportunities as, as uh, Dale said, now with the combination of the two departments, we're really starting to re-envision how this is gonna look like in the future when we're back on campus, bringing these different pieces together. One, it's wonderful that there are options uh, with the new funding coming forward as well, too, because there's so many great ideas that have actually spun off of IDP that are related to ideas coming from students. So we are really looking forward to that uh, opportunity to expand our programming in that area. And really, um, to, to what Dale just said about being grassroots, IDP always has been grassroots, and we want to continue that because that's where we get the best buy and best take from students. And we, we are looking forward to doing that in the future as well. I like to take this opportunity as well to give a little plug for uh, the non-credit credential and cultural and social awareness that COGS has partnered with several bodies across campus to run. So there's another opportunity to find out what's being offered on campus uh, and who those campus partners are. Uh, I can just add to that um, briefly as well, Paul. So just for students that do have um, feedback to provide about uh, workshops or different offerings that we have for graduate studies. I'll put a link in um, the chat, but you can always email us at um, our grad admin inbox with ideas. So if there's a workshop that you'd like to see or a particular topic, um, I'd be happy to connect with you and explore possibilities of offering that. Fantastic. Thank you, Haley. uh what supports are available for phd supervisors i guess i'll broaden this to graduate student supervisors to address mental health and process challenges experienced by the students that sounds like a question for sophie mm. yes um i mentioned earlier the early alert um can be used for that purpose um, as long as you have a CWL to log in. Uh, so staff, faculty, as well as TAs can, can use that if you have a concern about a student. Um, another way is just to connect directly with health and wellness if you prefer to do it that way. So whichever, whichever mode is most comfortable for you, um, we do have a few staffs uh, every day on site, as well as uh, working from home. So somebody will get back to you um, within the same day or the next day, depending on the, the time of the call. Um, and we, we've had, just from personal experience, pre-pandemic as well, have had those kinds of situations. So um, one thing we've learned is early intervention pays off. So if you are concerned about a, a student, please reach out to us or use the early alert system and we'll be happy to follow up with the student. Uh, do you have any suggestions on optimizing how to determine who or what resource to reach out to regarding specific questions? Is there a sp suggested approach? I found I've spent a lot of energy and time that in person I could tackle in much less determining who to contact and waiting for responses, which sometimes suggest contacting someone else. Sounds like a general question, so we can kind of throw that out to the whole panel on that. Be a good one for Haley. Yeah, I think um, in general, if you have questions about graduate specific services, um, that grad admin email that I had sent in the chat for workshops, that's a kind of a gen general email associated with our communications team. Um, that's where we take website feedback, et cetera. So that could be a starting point. We also have a grad ask um, email where you can send general requests to get direction. Um, this is something that someone else uh, may be able to speak to more than me, but I'm also thinking that your supervisor could be a good starting point um, to connect with as well as our graduate community facilitators. So 
um, Peter mentioned those community facilitators a little bit earlier, but they are peer students there to support other students and build community. So if you have questions about something, they can be a starting place as well. They're well linked in with um, COGS and other student services, so they can likely direct you to other resources and services. And I'll just plug to our office, uh, like not to take away from anything that uh, grad studies does to support students, but often we're the first point of contact in terms of getting your visa and all the different pieces. We're happy to do that. Like we are kind of the one stop shop. And even if we can't help with a specific case uh, immediately, we generally know who to connect you to. We work very closely with COGS. We work closely with other partners on campus, health and wellness. And so we're happy to play that role as well, too, especially right now where there's this whole flux of, you know, getting you to Canada and, and ensuring that you're getting settled once you're here. We're happy to do that. So feel free to connect with our office as well. And then uh, so you do you want to speak to that as well, because I know that there is a fair variety of health and wellness resources available across campus. Yeah, for sure. Um, our admins are very well versed if as a first point of contact, if you're not sure and you need a little bit of direction, uh, they can offer some guidance as far as uh, services go. Uh, we do have an international counselor that works closely with IPS as well as an Aboriginal counselor and more generalist as part of our team. So um, if in doubt, like I think one thing we've noticed to all, all of us working from home it takes often a, a bit more legwork, um, but sometimes just doing that first reach out, it can open doors and, and get you connected to the proper resources. So, yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, and the Ombuds office uh, would also like to let everyone know that they are there to provide referrals regarding various issues as well. Uh, when traveling from another country, it seems like the cost of staying in a hotel in the city of arrival is at around 2000 Canadian dollars. Can UBCO help offset these costs in some way? I assume they're speaking to the quarantine period. I'm uh, not aware of any discussions that are already underway about that, but I'm going to take it up with the provost uh, to figure out whether we can do something with it. Dale, are you aware of, or Phil, aware of anything already being addressed? So Phil's had some pretty recent conversations, so maybe we can start with Phil. Sure. Yeah, so as of like, um, uh, nothing specific to this latest policy that we've seen. Um, however, in terms of the actual cost of it, uh, there are, um, for example, the $2,000 seems to be actually much higher than what it, it is costing people in reality. The numbers that are actually coming out for the stays are lower. Um, depending on the hotel, I think I, we've been told around three to 400, including food and those pieces. So it is lower than the 2000. That doesn't make it, you know, I mean, it's somewhat less, but it still is a significant amount of money. Um, but yeah, the funding piece, uh, I think that would be great if we can follow up on potential options for that to, to fund that because that is a very recent development and was rolled out quite quickly by the government. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I noticed that the grad student bursary this year became open again for applications in January of this year. And on the website, this is not within the dates stated on the website. Are the dates changing? is the way to make sure that we are going to be emailed out to all grad students since so many of us do not find this information in time when we need it. And if no one tells you about it and you don't know. Got a question from Nathan or Haley or both? Balance between the two really. <laughs> Sorry to call all your kids. I was just going to say um, the graduate student bursary uh, would be run out of enrollment services and I was just looking on their website and I didn't see any information pertaining to January. Um, so I don't know if Nathan have you heard any other information on that. Hi, uh, no, I haven't. Um, that would be a question for enrollment services. So I think a uh, link was shared by Cindy. Um, for the bursary program. So I will also share a link down below and you can easily get in touch with enrollment services to ask for further clarification.
Okay. Uh, I believe that brings us to the end of our list of questions. Uh, does anybody have any follow-up questions that they want to finish up with? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, all, as all of our panelists have said, this year has been a unusual challenge. Uh, we're very proud of the resiliency and the strength and dedication that you've shown during these, well, everybody keeps saying unprecedented times, but I suppose it's because it's true. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out if you're struggling or you have suggestions or ideas. We are happy to uh, receive that information uh, and to help you out. As I said earlier, we'll be circulating a summary of our conversation today uh, with any further details that we feel might be helpful. Uh, and this, I believe, session has been recorded as well. As I said earlier, uh, oh no, we're at the end. Uh, I wanna thank all of our panelists uh, and contributors to the town hall today and all of you students for coming and with such great and interesting questions for us to explore together. Uh, and I hope you a, get a chance to enjoy the sunshine today because that's a bit rare this time of year and have a great rest of your week. Thank you all. <laughs>